Hey, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so um, my name is Milo Sprague. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, which is located just a few miles down the road in, uh, in Santa Clara. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, hosting this fireside chat with Justin Harvey, who is the VP uh, and CTO of Global Solutions at FireEye. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take a minute uh, to thank the uh, California-Israel Chamber of Commerce and Talia for hosting uh, today's conference with this great group of companies, uh, investors, uh, startup entrepreneurs, and industry leaders. Thanks very much, Talia. Uh, SVB has been partnering with the Chamber here in the Valley for a large number of years, uh, as well as with the uh, startup uh, and venture community in Israel, where we've had an office for over 10 years in Herzliya and have been operating there. Um, as CTO of the bank for the last three and a half years, um, I've had the uh, great honor of working with a large number of our uh, our startup companies, especially those that are focused on technology solutions uh, for the enterprise and spe specifically for uh, financial services. Um, and FireEye is actually a great, uh, great uh, example of that kind of a partnership where we've, you know, banked the company for a long time uh, and we've also had established a, a deep uh, technology partnership. They've been part of our technology stack for some time and we're uh, very satisfied customers. In fact, we have a couple of folks in the audience who are representing our security office today. They surprised me by showing up, so welcome, guys. Uh, um, Anyway, let's get started with that. Uh, I know we're all anxious to hear uh, Justin's view, both on the threat landscape and also the next couple of chapters of uh, FireEye's uh, exciting success story. Uh, so, uh, Justin, you had a, a wide-ranging security career across a number of organizations and developed uh, expertise in a number of areas, including cloud-targeted attacks, threat intelligence, incident response, and security operations. Uh, first of all, just a level set, can you give us the elevator pitch on FireEye, what your products and services do? Talk about your current role there uh, and how that kind of overlays with your, your experience. Sure. Hey, uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Thanks to Talia for, for hosting. Thanks, Milo. I think the last guy who was up here sitting in your seat was going to tell a joke. I'll tell a joke if you guys. <laughs> it, so what do you call Iron Man without his suit? Stark naked. <laughs> All right, so let's continue. So I'm Justin Harvey, uh, CTO at FireEye. I've been doing security for 20 years. I got started uh, actually here in the Valley in 94 when I worked for a, a, the first national ISP in the U.S. called Netcom. Anyone remember Netcom? Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when I go international, no one ever knows what Netcom is, but I'm glad there are some familiar faces here. Uh, this Japanese guy came in to our office. I was working in the NOC at the time, and he's like, hey, you guys have been hacked, and you've lost all your credit cards. And we're like, ah. And then we had to set up the first firewall. We'd, we'd never even heard about firewalls, so uh, we set up a Livingston firewall back in the day in 94, if you guys remember Livingston. And uh, that guy turned out to be Sutomo Shimamura, and the guy who hacked us was Kevin Mitnick. So... <laughs> We had to learn very quickly about network security, firewalls, cops, uh, tripwire, all this stuff to secure our Unix boxes. And that's where it started for me. Um, uh, I come from uh, the Mandian acquisition where uh, I was chief strategist and also started uh, the non-IR side of the business at Mandian. Uh, the, the elevator pitch for FireEye comes in three areas. First is you guys probably all know about FireEye being the first uh, sandbox type of uh, malware analysis engine. So the, the primary vectors of attack uh, for targeted attacks is, of course, malware, right? It's not SQL injection. It's not the other stuff. So uh, the primary vehicle by which that's delivered is through web. So we have a web product. So when people click on links and download the malware, we grab the malware. We've built a, uh, we have a purpose-built engine. Our founder, Ashar Aziz, Started this over 10 years ago, trying to rethink and reimagine security. He approached VMware, Microsoft, all the biggies out there and said, I want to build this engine where we put in the malware and we look at it from all different aspects, the entire kill chain or the entire life cycle of the malware. They all said, you're crazy. So he actually had to build from the ground up a virtualization execution engine, what we call MVX, uh, the multi-vector execution engine. So we have that for the web. We have it for email, the two primary attack vectors for targeted attacks. Uh, but that's what FireEye is known for. We also have, uh, from the Mandiant acquisition, we have the best incident responders in the world. So it's funny, I keep hearing and meeting with all the companies who said, target this, Neiman Marcus that, Neiman Marcus that. 
JP Morgan. I'm not confirming or denying there are clients, but some of the biggest breaches that you read about all the time were there helping them, and that's where Mandiant came from. And we also had an endpoint product uh, called MIR, Mandiant for Incident Response. Uh, and Mandiant for security operations, the ability to query all of your endpoints and look for uh, uh, targeted threats by looking with uh, indicators of compromise. So we've got good set of products, really good people, and of course we have the managed services that ties it all together. Great. So I'm sure as part of your role, you're spending quite a bit of time both, you know, traveling a lot, talking to uh, industry experts, surveying the, the, the kind of the threat landscape, uh, as well as talking to uh, a lot of your customers. So uh, given that you're doing both of those things, uh, first of all, what would you say are the key uh, emerging threats in 2014 that people should be thinking about? And then to juxtapose that with what you're hearing from customers, where are they focusing on the right things and where do you think maybe some of the potential blind spots are that enterprises should be thinking more about right now? Now. Emerging threats. Well, it's hard to characterize emerging threats and say, hey, you guys need to look out for this certain vector of attack. I would say it's more, it's still about awareness in my role and what I see in the industry. It's, it's about getting the message out to these enterprise and governments around the world. I, uh, I spent the summer in Asia and Singapore, took my family out there, and it's amazing how many big businesses, how many big banks and governments just don't even have the, necess the necessary telemetry to detect if they're attacked. I mean, part of my, part of my spiel or my act with them is to say, look, 62%, according to Mandiant studies last year, uh, of organizations were notified by a third party that they were breached, okay? 62% of all the breaches that we run. So if I came to you with an indicator of a compromise or, or an IOC or an IP, could you, Mr. CISO, question all of your endpoints for the, the necessary uh, telemetry information in order to respond to the incident? And typically they say no. Well, what do you do today? Well, if we're hacked, then we'll just rebuild the box. Okay, well, there's probably a little bit more education that needs to happen in that respect. So I think, number one, it's awareness that targeted threats are, are everywhere. Uh, and uh, the second, uh, and maybe one A to that is uh, many organizations don't know the threat actors or even um, what kind of threat groups would be targeting them. I talked to a major agricultural co uh, organization uh, company in the U.S. And uh, do you guys remember the, the news, um, I think it was one or two years ago, about these FBI agents who nabbed some Chinese guys in a field because they were taking seeds and stuff? I'm talking to other agricultural companies, and they're like, yeah, it's not us. It's not going to happen to us. We're okay. So I keep getting this message. I don't think anyone is safe out there. Um, intellectual property theft and uh, cyber criminals are targeting everyone. So I think it's, a, um, uh, it's an awareness issue. There's a second one here. And that is, uh, I think, part of the problem. I keep talking to all these companies about technology. Techno it's not just about the technology. It's about having skilled people to be able to respond to the alerts and skilled people to be able to proactively hunt for evil or uh, attacks throughout the network. Um, I think if, if there was one message that I could give to the, uh, to the Israeli investments and companies trying to get their start or moving up, don't just think about technology or product. Think about how you're going to build a service or a methodology or um, the ability to rope in people. Uh, and the advice I would give to my kids and all your kids is get into security. <laughs> You'll always have a job because uh, uh, there was, um, what's the big company that does the, um, uh, Frost and Sullivan, I think, did, a, did the recent thing about uh, surveying uh, information security workers. And there is a huge need for skilled security people in the world, not only salespeople, not only technologists, not only marketing, but, the, but if you, it, this, um, this vertical, this industry is in freaking credible. And uh, sorry, I know I'm going off on, I'll finish with this. You have plenty of time. So All right, I'll finish with this. Um, I can't confirm or deny if the big retailer is our client. But I did read, I don't have any, I swear, I don't have any inside knowledge, but I will say I read the Senate committee uh, testimony and hearings and everything on Target. And the, you know, the story goes, they had FireEye, they caught the alert, it went to an Indian sock, and the Indian sock just said acknowledge and said it was done, right? And a lot of people wanna say, well, if you're running this product, if you're running this product, if you're running this product, look, it's not just a technology problem. It's about having the skilled people to say, 
okay, I understand that that was an alert and I need to execute on it. And part of what we're doing from a fire perspective is also not only telling you it was bad, but telling you more context, confidence, risk level, what's the net effect of that? And I think that bleeds over into the threat intel a little bit. Everyone has a threat intel feed. In order to be uh, current or in order to, be, to derive the most value out of it, it really needs to add context, not that it was just bad. Okay, good answer. Long answer, good answer. Um, actually, you talked a lot about the, the criticality of having skilled people uh, in addition to technology, so this is actually a great segue. I mean, you've been now at FireEye for about going on a year, uh, coming over with the mandate acquisition. So talk a little bit. I think people are pretty clear about the, the difference between the organizations, but there's some clear synergy there, I think, if you think about the, the product offerings, you know, technology versus actually a managed service uh, that you mentioned earlier. But um, can you talk a little bit about the, you know, how the integration is going, you know, from both a, a product uh, development point of view, is the synergy as clear as it seems like it would be on paper? Um, and you know, what are maybe some of the surprises that have come up, and uh, uh, you know, what is the what's changed, if anything, in the go-to-market strategy? Good question. So, um, was part of that question like the roadmap and the where we're taking this whole ship? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> you can you can include that. Well, I, some I of the, think you are interested also to hear a little bit about the the last twelve months. Like sure, what's the happened. last twelve yeah. months have been really interesting because you take an East Coast military, ex-military type of organization and you marry it with a West Coast uh, blue jeans sandals type of organization. I'm a Bay Area guy myself. Uh, for most of the twenty years, I'd say about ten, eleven. I've lived here in the Bay Area, but I've had to wear a suit because I work for Mandy, and it's been a weird combination. East Coast people definitely think a lot different than the West Coast. And the guy who was up here two ago talking about the cloud stuff in California, I was like, right on, man. That's awesome. Um, the, uh, so it's been, I think it's been a happy marriage, right? I think we're getting out of the honeymoon period now. Um, the, it was an interesting marriage because, not only because Dave DeWalt was on our board, but um, it's interesting because Mandian was about 75% services and 25% product. FireEye, on the other hand, was about 95% product, 5% services. And so it was a really even match. So all of the services go to Mandian, all of Mandian's products go to FireEye. And it was, a, it was a, a, what I would characterize as, a, as the perfect match. Plus, I, I in, my, in my humble opinion, I think we married uh, the two companies that had the best threat intel in the world. Uh, Mandian has the best threat intel in the world simply because we are on the front lines of, of warfare versus um, uh, state-sponsored and uh, organized crime breaches around the world. So we're collecting that information and curating it and putting it back into, uh, giving it back to our customers in a variety of ways. And FireEye, of course, has, um, has the most number of sensors, and uh, I like to think we're, we're the leader when it comes to uh, signature list-based detection. I feel like we invented the space. So be able to put all this threat intelligence together, the, the customers win in, in that equation. Great. Um, you can comment more on the roadmap as we go on, but uh, I, I want to actually mention, uh, I mentioned a couple of my colleagues from our security officer in the audience, and one of the things that I hear uh, keeps them up at night, or one of the things that they're focused on is the increasingly uh, uh, rapid, the, the speed at which uh, vulnerabilities are being weaponized, where as it may have been, you know, a month that folks had time to patch their, their vulnerabilities in their operating systems, you know, now you're seeing, uh, you know, weaponization happening like overnight, maybe next day. Um, so that creates an increasing burden on IT departments, on security departments. Um, what are your thoughts about that, that issue? You know, what, if anything, is uh, FireEye doing to help in that area? Well, that's the space I think we play best in, signature-less based detection, right? I think, um, I don't think that prevention is dead, and I don't think signature-based detection is dead, because signature-based detection, at least on the network side, that helps speed things up. If you know about it, boom, you can block it. But signature-based detection and prevention is what we're doing on the endpoint. There's, there's, no, there's no such thing as like, being able to just randomly block stuff. So signature-based detection and prevention is still out there, just in we're changing the game a little bit. Um, it's crazy to think how easy it is to weaponize these days. So you can go on to Tor, the dark net, the, the alley of the internet, right, the onion router, and you can go to websites. You guys all know Tor, right? Anyone not know Tor? I mean, anonymous internet browsing. You can go to Silk Road, look that up. Uh, Google Silk Road, Silk Road FBI. Um, 
But you can go to some of these websites where um, uh, just some Eastern European dudes are throwing up a website and saying, hey, pick what, pick what flavor of AV your target has, pick what IDS, what firewall, and you can go and select drop downs and take it out to the um, uh, checkout. And in some cases, they'll dynamically generate malware that they know can penetrate the penetrate the target. So, the uh, the uh, the invention of this sort of take off the shelf malware, take malware and, and be able to change it around is just going to get past everything, most of everything, all the defenses that are out there today. But not if you're running FireEye, of course. Um, but there's other methods of uh, delivery besides network and web. Okay, so let's move on to a, a question that I know everybody's hoping that I will ask, so I am going to ask it. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, st state-sponsored attacks? Um, I think everybody may be aware that Mandian gained a lot of notoriety uh, back in uh, February of 2013 when they exposed a lot of the cyber attacks originating in China, and that became a, quite a big media event. So Justin and I had a chance to talk on the phone earlier this week, and he said he could share some of the backstory on that event, what, what happened, uh, some things that may, you may not have heard about, so it would be great to hear about that. All right, so here's the story behind <laughs> APT1. Um, first off, I think that uh, uh, most, a lot of this has been going on for years, right? The top security companies have been detecting state-sponsored attacks in, in organizations for years, so it's not some problem that we just discovered and said, hey, we're just gonna raise the flag. But essentially what happened is the New York Times was, uh, was uh, ran a story in October of 2000, 12, I think, is that right? Yeah, 2012, and said that all these Chinese guys who were inner party, inner communist party um, uh, influencers were doing foreign investment. We know the Chinese invest in the U.S. and Israel and all sorts of areas, and they were taking the proceeds and taking a little bit off the top, right, to fund their stuff back home. So they were corrupt. Imagine that, politicians being corrupt. And um, New York Times ran an expose, and the way that the uh, the uh, the way that China operates is they're like, all right, someone's talking to them. We need to figure out. We need to infiltrate. Put one of our APT teams on it, and we track about 20 unique uh, Chinese APT groups. So we need someone to infiltrate the New York Times and start figuring out who the sources are, so we can put them in. Um, uh, prison camps. I don't know where they sent. I was going to say Siberia, but I don't know where they sent people in China, right? Probably somewhere near Mongolia. Um, and uh, so they got hacked. They, uh, they detected it. They called us in. We went in. And uh, within about a month, a month and a half, we cleared them out. And uh, I guess it was a slow news day in December, um, but the... Um, the New York Times said, hey, we're going to run a story about this because this is, everyone should know about this. And so they talked to the CISO and the CISO called us and they said, well, what do you think about this problem? How about we write an article about it? And we're like, okay, we can, we can support that. So we talked to our legal team. They wrote a story on it in uh, January of 2013. And then the Chinese uh, Communist Party wrote a, like a two-line statement, something to the effect of um, these, are ground these accusations are groundless and baseless without proof, yada, yada. And we're like, oh, yeah? <laughs> so we put together this report. And Kevin Mandia, our founder, took this report to the CIA, NSA, White House, and uh, DOJ and said, we're about to release this. Is there any reason why we shouldn't? Is there going to be attacks? Is there going to be physical attacks on us? Are we putting our people in harm? Are we putting any current operations or operatives in harm? They're like, no, this is, this is awesome. I mean, we really we support this. So then we came out with APT1. It was um, uh, there have definitely been some naysayers out there and said this could have been anyone. It could have been people using Chinese servers. It could have been all this stuff. But what was not published uh, in the report is a lot more of our evidence. So a couple points. Uh, number one, um, these the ABT1 group loved to compromise servers and then do Facebook <laughs> and Google and Gmail. So when we were watching them, we got to see their Facebook posts and their emails to girlfriends and say, oh, man, I don't like being in Shanghai working in this military group, blah, blah, blah. I'm paraphrasing. 
but uh, you can you can see the natural uh, progression of communication that um, that we analyzed, and we didn't release a lot of that the, the pictures and the Facebook pages, simply because we didn't want those people um, uh, sent to Mongolia. Um, no, I know it's not Mongolia. That's not part of China, but we didn't want them sent to a prison camp. Um, and then the, uh, 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 the the second aspect of that is we didn't release all of the intel we had on APT uh, on any APT group, not only APT1. So we released our indicators of compromise, but we held some back. And it's astonishing over the past year, we saw as soon as APT1 came out, boom, like everything dropped. And But we also did a diff between the intel we withheld and the intel we gave out. And it was astonishing because they didn't change one single piece of attack, one node or anything of the stuff that we held back. But everything else went down to zero. And we're like, all right, maybe we did the world some good. But then every attack group came back. As soon as we could get the data and we were working the breaches, we saw everyone else. They re-weaponized within the period of a few months. So, so what, just to follow up quickly on that one, I mean, what, what are you seeing now with, um, with state-sponsored attacks? Is it going up? Is it staying relatively flat? I mean, obviously, the attack vectors are changing and progressing, but what about the, the volume and the, uh, you know, the kind of the, the rigor of the attacks coming in now? Uh, absolutely back to normal levels. Normal levels is the same levels we were seeing before APT1 or the New York Times article was uh, posted. Um, it's not necessarily on the rise. We think it's pretty steady. I mean, the, uh, the thing, the, the comments I want to make about state-sponsored attacks are who could have guessed, and we still don't know internally, why the heck they attacked uh, that um, healthcare company um, to take uh, Social Security data. Did you guys read this? Um, it probably happened two or three months ago. It was like Southern Community Health or something. It was a big healthcare breach. And, um, and we know 100% accuracy, it was definitely state-sponsored attacks. But it's like, what do they want with our Social Security numbers? They didn't take, they didn't take um, PCI data. They didn't take cardholder data. They didn't take um, doctor's information. They didn't take the medical records. They just got names, addresses, and Social Security numbers. Very weird. Um, but I would say um, the areas that are on the rise, duh, duh is uh, retail, organized crime. And um, of the, uh, I can't go into um, the brands that we're working with, but in there we're seeing exactly the same threat actors and all of the biggies that we're doing. And they're all um, Eastern European, not state sponsored. I want to I want to make that clear since, um, um, there was a little bit of a, a riff when one of our Intel analysts made some assumptions on, the, on, um, on a recent banking one, and they tried to say they suspected um, Eastern European organized crime was colluding with um, Eastern European state-sponsored uh, cyber terrorism, and we have no evidence of that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, very interesting to hear how the direct impact of the, the publicity that you, you made uh, and how it actually like played out in the actual uh, security cyber attack ecosystem. That's very interesting. Um, FireEye has a close working relationship with a number of key agencies and a number of governments. Can you talk a little bit about uh, you know, what you're doing maybe with Israel uh, in particular, given the audience, uh, and potentially the United States or other governments? Sure. So. Uh the softball answer is we, we share intelligence with a lot of um, uh, world governments um, on uh, state-sponsored attacks, typically not the organized crime. Uh, there is a uh, – uh, Israel has a national uh, – I know I'm going to get this wrong. Forgive me. It's a national technology center for security and several other stuff. It starts with a Y. I think. Uh, if anyone's interested, I'll, I'll hook you up. We're cooperating with that uh, organization and sharing intelligence and technology. Uh, one of our interesting, uh, one of the interesting duties I have since I have a worldwide role is uh, repatriating top secret and classified information to these governments. So one of the things that we do is when we see uh, data being exfiltrated, uh, or if we see uh, destinations that are within our reach somewhere in the U.S., uh, state-sponsored attackers, of course, don't uh, hack or SCP directly files directly to their Shanghai office. Duh. They find really soft targets uh, in DMZs, uh, typically in U.S. companies. They get there and then they jump, right? So what we do is when we find these jump boxes, we approach the organization and say, hey, we're, give a little, get a little, right? Give us access to this box. 
uh, we'll put our telemetry around it, watch the network and the system, and we'll give you uh, key threat information that is applicable to you. But what ends up happening is top secret intellectual property or troop movement plans or some sort of stuff will come out. Uh, like I went to Japan two months ago and the Intel team was like, hey, you're going to Japan, you're meeting with the Ministry of Defense, can you give them these top secret documents that <laughs> were exfiltrated from their network, right? Because they're not a customer, but uh, we'll see their stuff going through some of our customers. Great, I think we have about two, three minutes left, so we're kind of coming up on time, but um, you kind of hit on this earlier when you were talking about managed services and that being kind of a key kind of next phase of the, the security in industry, industry's uh, maturation, but uh, for some of the uh, startups that are out in the audience and the entrepreneurs, um, uh, obviously uh, a, a FireEye kind of exit or success story is probably one that wouldn't be too bad for a lot of entrepreneurs. What, what kind of advice would you give uh, the entrepreneurs in the security community in terms of thinking about next steps? Oh, gosh. Uh, let's see here. I would say, number one, uh, you guys heard me rant on this at the beginning, but it's not just a technology problem. Think about if you're creating a product, think about some complementary uh, services that can go along with that to, to, uh, to augment uh, the customer's expertise. Since the, since the vast majority of the customers I've seen really need a lot of help institutionalizing and getting... Um, uh, getting the the product or the technology that's a very complicated space and not all organizations have superstars like you guys right uh, the second one is um, uh, I know it's hype but the the words threat intelligence uh, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of uh, companies that say yes we have a threat we have threat intelligence but I would say um, the way to really get some traction is to share that threat intel with others. I mean, give a, give a little, get a little, inform. Um, not with, uh, this is, you know, e easier said than done, but form relationships maybe, not necessarily with competitors, but with other organizations that are like-minded in order to get your threat intelligence to them and back and forth. Um, I've talked to a lot of CISOs uh, over the past uh, few years, and the, the feedback I've been getting within the last couple months is, is resounding. It's all about threat intelligence. They're like, we need some sort of vehicle and ways to integrate threat intelligence more operationally within our organizations and to share that with other, uh, and share it with our partners and so on. So uh, think about when you're developing these products how threat intelligence will play into that, but don't overhype it. You know, don't say I have a threat intelligence, big data backend in the cloud that can also be seen on mobile, right? That was supposed to be a joke, right? I'm trying to weave all of these terms together. Um, and I would say, uh, and this is just, it's not necessarily a business idea, but the guy, the gentleman this morning that did the keynote on, from Qualcomm on the Internet of Everything or Internet of Things, man, as a security guy, I was sitting there and I was like, that is, this is going to be interesting. Because I think there's so much uh, opportunity there that is going to be, like, I don't even have any ideas off the top of my head, but the ability, if you guys could innovate around, uh, around that aspect, it will be freaking incredible. There's so much money to be had there, and that's where the, the money is being poured, right? Mobile, cloud, big data, internet of everything. Great. Well, Justin, this has been really uh, great to hear your, your thoughts, so thank you so much. I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.